is Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Hear God's word. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. This is the word of the Lord. Please pray with me. Father, in my speaking and in our hearing and especially in our doing, let us be faithful to you, our rock and our redeemer. History is very important to Christians. I know that's a shocking statement from a historian. (laughs) We should value and study not only biblical history, but the history of the church. That's especially relevant on Reformation Sunday as we think about that great event in the history of the church, the Protestant Reformation. For years, Reformation Sunday was a very important celebration for Protestant congregations. That October Sunday was nothing less than a second birthday party for the church, a second Pentecost, if you will. Today, few Protestant congregations celebrate Reformation Day as it deserves to be celebrated because this day recalls the mighty awakening that God brought to his church. Reminds us of a profoundly effective effort to restore the faith and practice of the New Testament community. The key person in the Reformation was Martin Luther. He is a man of enigmas, a man of grand contradictions, a man of faith. He was acutely sensitive to sin and profoundly receptive to God. Reformer, teacher, orator, translator, theologian, composer, we just sang his hymn, and family man, he symbolizes much of that which for the Reformation stood. His influence is monumental. In the past 500 years, only Jesus has had more books written about him than Martin Luther. A major body of Protestants call themselves by his name, and millions more acknowledge his influence. Who was this man, and what did he accomplish? Of the many areas of Luther's life, teaching, and impact upon the world that we could examine this morning, I'm going to focus on three his conceptions of justification by faith, sola scriptura, the idea that scripture alone is our authority, and the priesthood of all believers. Martin Luther was born in 1483 in Germany. After receiving a BA and an MA at the University of Leipzig, he joined the Augustinian order of monks. The decision to do so was prompted by a lightning attack that was very close to where he was and spooked his horse and almost threw him off. And in anguish, in response, he cried, St. Anne, I will become a monk. And become a monk he did. One of the most scrupulous of all the monks. He was ordained to the priesthood in 1507 and earned a doctorate in theology five years later. And then he taught for the remainder of his life in New Testament at the University of Wittenberg. As a monk, however, Luther had no peace with God or himself. He had an extremely troubled conscience, and he was preoccupied with guilt. In distress, he repeatedly proclaimed, You ask me if I love God? Love God? Sometimes I hate him. Or, I see Christ as a stern judge, or to the gallows with Moses, because he gave us all these laws that I can't keep. Some reports indicate that Luther wore out the patience of his confessors in the confessional in the monastery. 
Whereas the average monk would be in and out in a couple of minutes. I mean, how much trouble can you get into? Are you in a monastery all day? <laughs> Luther would spend hours reciting all the things that he had done. He was exact. He was intense in his approach. He deeply probed his conscience and revealed a genuine desire before God because of his own sin. You see, Luther had accepted the entire medieval Catholic position that justification is a result of the good works people do. And he was desperately trying to do enough good works so that God would accept him. But he could never convince himself that the good works he did were sufficient to atone for his sins and make him in a right relationship with an almighty, perfect, holy God. Luther was especially terrified by the consecration of the Mass. At his ordination service, when he was going to serve the Mass for the first time, in which Catholics believed that the bread and wine became the actual body of Jesus Christ, he was so paralyzed with fear that the normally eloquent speaker couldn't say anything. He was totally silent. Luther continued to accuse himself on account of his sins, he could not find a mediator. In 1510 and 11, he went on Rome to a pilgrimage. He thought, maybe the Pope will be a sufficient mediator. Maybe if I confess my sins to the Pope, I will feel forgiven. But he got to Rome, and he saw that the Pope and his entourage were living lavishly on monies supplied to the church. And he became even further disillusioned with the church of his day. Luther's sensitivity to sin was driving him crazy. He was an expert in the law. And as he studied the Old Testament law, he realized, I can never live up to this. Neither my aesthetic works nor my spiritual experience bring me comfort. His soul was in constant torment. You see, the church of his day taught that ordinary Christians who failed to reach the heights of sainthood must pay temporal penalties in this life and the next, purgatory, to atone for their sin. It was commonly believed that people could reduce these penalties by acts of good works and penance or by paying indulgences, cash payments to the church on their behalf or the behalf of others. But Luther couldn't believe that his own good works or a cash payment could satisfy God's demands. But in 1516, Luther had his famous tower experience, and he rediscovered the biblical doctrine of justification by faith. As he's pouring over Paul's epistle to the Romans, Luther was struck by the verses we read this morning. It powerfully gripped him. The shackles fell from his eyes as he read, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, He through faith is righteous shall live. Here was the discovery that shook the world, that set humanity on a new course. Here was the doctrine that inspired the rise of Lutheranism, Presbyterianism, Methodism, of Congregationalists and Baptists and Mennonites and dozens of other denominations. The just shall live by faith, not by works. Luther had been overwhelmed by unforgiven guilt. How can I, as an individual, he asked, be assured of the forgiveness of sins and thus of the favor of God? And then he read this passage from Romans. And as he later remarked, it seemed to me as if I had been born anew, that I had entered into the open gates of paradise. Previously, Luther had understood the righteousness of God as punitive, by which God punishes the sinner who has fallen short of God's requirements, of God's standards, of God's laws. But now he came to understand the righteousness of God as God's graciousness by which he accepts sinners 
while we're still in our sin. One doesn't need to work his way to salvation. One needs only to receive salvation as a free gift by faith. Luther felt he had been born again. Luther finally realized that we can be saved by the law only if we obey it perfectly. But if we violate or break one part of it, then Scripture says we've broken all of it. And since we can't achieve our salvation by our obedience to the law, justification must be by grace, God's gift that goes out to undeserving sinners. We're not judged on how well we live up to the law of God, but on the basis of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Our salvation depends not on our own obedience, but on Christ's perfect obedience. In salvation, then, The cross is central. Jesus Christ is our substitute. He bears our sins. In Jesus of Nazareth, God takes upon himself our sin and guilt so that we can be pardoned, so that we can be set free from the penalty of sin, which is divine judgment and hell. And God considers us to be righteous because we're covered by the righteousness of Christ Even though we remain sinful, God counts us as righteous because we received Christ as our Lord and Savior. We've put our trust in Him. We are in Him, Paul writes. Faith, then, is not the ground, but the instrument for our justification. Faith is still necessary, but it's not a human virtue for which we can take credit. It's simply an empty vessel that holds the righteousness of Christ. But faith is not simply passive surrender. It's also active trust, venture, obedience. While we're justified by faith alone, Luther taught, faith must not remain alone, but should work through love. If we have faith in Christ, we are sure of two things. Our sins are forgiven, and Christ will never let us go. In some evangelical and charismatic circles today, the illusion is fostered that we are in God's favor because of the quality of our religious experience or the depth of our religious devotion. Luther reminds us that faith is a gift by which we're united to Christ. Religious and experience and devotions result from justification. They don't produce it. The fact that we're saved should lead us to perform good works, to be virtuous, to love God, to seek deep experiences with Him, but none of those acts can ever save us. A second important aspect of Luther's work and teaching was his rediscovery of the Scriptures and the emphasis upon them as the sole authority for faith and life. You see, for centuries, the Scriptures were not stressed in the Christian church. Written in long, forgotten languages, Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic, they were available at the time only in Latin, a tongue spoken by only a handful of scholars and church leaders. Prior to 1450, when Gutenberg invented movable type, very few members of the laity could read Only about 1% of Europeans could read at this time. So few people knew personally what the Bible taught. Their knowledge about Christianity largely depended upon the traditions of the church. The invention of the printing press made books much less expensive and education much more available. And these events prepared the way so that when Luther wrote tracts explaining the essence of the faith, people were able to read and understand them. Luther's study of the Scriptures and the early church fathers convinced him that the evil church had significantly departed from biblical teaching and the practices and doctrines of the New Testament church. He was convinced that Scripture alone must be the authority for Christians. When he was tried for heresy at the Diet of Worms in 1521 in Germany, and told that he must denounce all the books he'd written. 
Luther famously replied, unless I am convicted by the scriptures and plain reason, I do not accept the authority of popes and councils, for they have contradicted each other. My conscience is captive to the Word of God. I cannot, I will not recant anything. To go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand, I can do no other. Luther sought to be directed only by the Scriptures. I simply taught, preached, and wrote God's Word. Otherwise, I did nothing, Luther said. Luther considered Scripture so important that he spent several years of his life translating the Bible into the German language, the language of the people. Ever the relentless perfectionist, he sometimes spent a month searching out the right German word. He went around the country talking to people in various vocations so he would have a better understanding of things that he was translating. Luther's Bible was the first time that a mass medium in the form of the printed word ever penetrated everyday life. No other work has had such a great impact upon a nation as Luther's German Bible. And he also had a strong impact on William Tyndall, the first one to translate the Bible into English. And since Tyndall's translation comprises about 90% of the King James Version, he had a huge impact on all English-speaking people as well. The Bible, then, is the source for our salvation and faith. Other books can and do help us understand the Bible better, but nothing can be substituted for the study of Scripture. And the Bible doesn't belong to the elite classes to the bishops and the theologians and the scholars and the nobles. It belongs to all of us. So let us reject all other authorities, the media, the university, even the church, when they contradict the scriptures. The importance Luther placed upon translating the scriptures into the plain German language and upon every Christian reading and studying the Bible leads to his third major contribution, Luther affirmed the priesthood of all believers. And so the Protestant church became the people's church. It belongs to the people. It's our work. It's our life. It's our responsibility under God. Luther strongly believed in the communion of the saints. He believed that our relationship with God is deeply impacted when we gather together as we are right now for worship Fellowship is central to the Christian faith. It is in the fellowship of diverse and free individuals that a community of faith and love enables us to offer our united praise to God. The priesthood of all believers means that there shouldn't be a sharp division between clergy and laity as there was in the medieval church. But even today, too many congregations view the clergy as the entertainers with you as the entertained, so I hope you're having a good time. <laughs> we view pastors as the hired experts. We expect pastors to study, to pray, to visit the sick, to counsel the troubled, to raise the cash, and state the position on everything of consequence for the rest of us. Some Christians even expect to live the Christian life vicariously through their pastors. But the priesthood of all believers means that each of us as Christians can relate directly to God. We don't need to go through a priest or a minister or any other intermediary to reach God. We can directly communicate with Him. We can walk intimately with Him day by day by day. This concept also means that each of us is a priest. Each of us is called to do God's work on earth. Each of us has a responsibility, a calling, we cannot leave the work of the church simply to a handful of paid professionals because all of us are called to serve. The Protestant church is a cooperative community. It's a body of people who confess faith in the same God, who have the same vision and goals. The doctrine of the priesthood of all believers should inspire us to join hands with Christians of all denominations and march forward to do God's work. <clears throat> 
to meet physical and spiritual needs wherever they exist. Like all the giants of history, Luther has been interpreted in many ways. To some, he was insane, psychologically disturbed, a man given the verbal outbursts and strong language who constantly predicted his own death. To others, Luther was a religious fanatic, an egomaniac. What else would explain his willingness to stand virtually alone against the princes of the state and the leaders of the church? What else can explain his preoccupation with guilt and sin? To still others, Luther was a hero who could do no wrong, a knight in shining armor, a champion of conscience and the church. A balanced assessment of Luther, I believe, asserts that he was indeed a titan, a man of extraordinary insight, wisdom, conviction, and faith. And yet, like other outstanding Christians, the disciples, St. Augustine, Mother Teresa, he had flaws, he made mistakes, he experienced periods of doubt. But his accomplishments, as we have seen, were truly monumental. His rediscovery of justification by faith was the spark that ignited the renewal and redirection of the church. And his teachings that we have examined today raise important questions 500 years after he declared them. Important questions for us. Are we trusting Christ for our salvation? Or do we think that our works will make us acceptable to God? Have we yielded our minds, wills, and hearts to Christ? Have we invited him into our lives? Have we surrendered ourselves to him to acknowledge that only Christ's death upon the cross can make us right with God? Do we consider the scriptures to be the sole authority for faith? Have we committed ourselves to studying the Bible to know God's will and plan for our lives? And are we exercising our prerogatives as God's priests? Are we communing directly and intimately with him? Are we playing our proper roles for his kingdom's work on earth? Although he was born more than 500 years ago, Martin Luther continues to speak to the church. May we ever be receptive to his instruction, for through him God has much to say. Amen.
using the words of the 